Good morning. I'm George Benson, president of the College of Charleston. Pleased to see you here this morning on this uh, so bright and so early. I also want to welcome people who are watching online around and across the country, friends, alumni, and, and parents. Uh, welcome to you uh, as well. I wanted to want to recognize a few people who are with us this morning. We have two trustees that are here, Renee Romberger, back here, Renee. John Bush, thank you both uh, for being with us this morning. I think Sharon Kingman is here. Sharon, yeah, there's Sharon. Sharon is the chair of our foundation board. Sharon, thank you also uh, for being here. Also want to recognize Steve Swanson sitting over here. Uh, Steve is uh, co-chairing our comprehensive fundraising campaign uh, along, with, uh, along with me. Uh, we are gathered here today to honor Steve and Maureen Kerrigan. They are sitting here in the, in the front row. Welcome, both of you, and thank you. Uh, to celebrate uh, both them and what they've done for us and the, this new program that we are launching, the School of Business Investment Program. Uh, the investment program is their vision. They wanted to do something to help our students become more competitive in the national and global marketplace. And, and uh, they... Uh, their vision was achieved with the help of uh, Dean Alan Chow, uh, also uh, Professor Mark Piles, and our foundation. I want to thank them as well for their part in this. But Steve and Maureen provided the transformational gift of more than half a million dollars to enable our students to invest real money in a real portfolio. Uh, and that is very, very special, and we're all excited about that. I actually wish I could participate or at least watch over your shoulders a little bit. Sounds like a lot of fun. We had a program like that where I went to school, but it wasn't real money. <laughs> Steve and Marina, I want you to know how grateful we are for your support of this program and, and for taking this opportunity to invest in our students. And, and by the way, I believe they are proud parents of two of our alumni. I know, they're, I know they have two, two children who are alums, and I'm, I'm sure they're, they're proud of them. <laughs> but, Thank you so much. Uh, we're so grateful, the entire college community, not just the business school. This does something for all of us. Uh, obviously, it gives the business school a boost on our students, but it, it increases the credibility and reputation of the College of Charleston as well, and that's in part why I'm here today to say thank you. Uh, the new investment program provides our students the opportunity to invest and create a real pro portfolio using real money. There are programs like this around the country, but there aren't very many that use real money. There, most of them uh, are, are, are make-believe, if you will. Uh, admission to the program is extremely competitive. There's a very serious interview process. Uh, uh, the students who gain acceptance become part of what we're calling our School of Business, School of Business Investment Society. And our inaugural class has 20 students. I think most of them are with us here this morning. Uh, I want to congratulate those students for making it into this, uh, into this wonderful program. I want you also to know that we're rooting for you, and we'll be watching very closely to see how well you do. With that, I'd like to bring up Mark Piles. Mark, I know you're here somewhere. Mark, come on up here. Let me tell you a little bit about Mark. Uh, Mark is a, is, a, is a professor here at the college. He's got a degree in finance uh, from Eastern Kentucky, a master's degree in economics, and a PhD in finance from the University of Kentucky. He's the author of numerous uh, scholarly uh, publications and is a respected voice in both the fields of finance and economics. Mark. Thank you. Thank you. I always say all that stuff about myself, too, but it sounds better when you say it. All right. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Obviously, those of you sitting in front of me, but also watching on the webcast around the country, we, uh, this is exciting. You know, we're happy about what we're doing. and We obviously recognize that you could be doing something else right now, maybe even should be doing something else right now. Uh, but uh, we're, we're happy and honored that you do this with us here today. We, uh, the mission's simple, and I'll go into it in a, in a few moments, but we simply want to put our students on display. We believe in our students, you know, and I believe in these students. These 20, I think, as you get a chance to know them today and into the future, they, they are the future. And particularly in the investments arena where I, where I live, uh, they, uh, they're as good as any I've seen. And so we just want to show it. We want to show people that. And so as we go through this, I want to give them as much time as certainly possible. And I'll, I'll keep my comments brief, but I do want to give a bit of an overview of how this works and how we came to where we are today. As excited as we are about what we have right now, we are infinitely more excited about what it could be. You know, it's up to us to make it that, but it certainly could be a point of pride, not just for the school, but for the college in general. Now, the investment program was began, quite obviously did begin, as a result of a very generous gift of over half a million dollars, as President Benson said. And of that half a million dollars, we are going to invest over the next five years a quarter of a million in public capital markets and another 150,000 in private capital markets. Now, that's, you know, that in itself actually makes this program fairly distinctive, and I'll talk about that here in a few moments a bit more. 
What we also feel is distinctive, but also critical, is that this is completely managed by the students. There is administrative oversight, of course, myself, and at the foundation level, but the decisions, 100%, funds go up, funds go down, based upon the student decision. You know, and that's, that was a critical component of why I agreed to do this, and I think why the Kerrigans agreed to make it happen. You know, we, don't, we want the students to understand how stuff works. And when st you learn, understand how stuff works, sometimes it works well, sometimes it doesn't work so well, and we want them to be responsible for that. It's a responsibility they've not only accepted, but they've embraced it much more so than even I expected them to. So we're very happy about that. The students do indeed have to apply. It is a fairly rigorous review process. And I'm sure it's only going to get more difficult as I get more and more applicants in future years. They are accepted, though the ones that get through the process, in the spring of each year for admittance into the entire next year to manage the funds. During that entire next year, they will manage both funds collectively, and then they'll turn it over to the new cohort of students, of course, with me overseeing the transition. Now, when we developed this, we, uh, we wanted to keep two things in mind. You know, this, uh, you know, it is relatively unique to have, uh, you know, students managing actual money, but it's not brand new by any means. And so we're not trying to invent the wheel here. We're just trying to put wrinkles in it. We're trying to take advantage of the flexibility that was given to us in the gift to make it not just be a standard run-of-the-mill type of investment program. And two notable ways we did that. One is we allow students to trade more than just the traditional equity assets. And a lot of funds, a lot of programs across the country, they restrict what uh, students can do, perhaps because they don't think they have the range of knowledge that it takes to trade all these other assets. But we live in a realistic world where there are, uh, there's a whole toolbox full of investable assets, and we don't want to constrain our students. We don't want to constrain their understanding and their knowledge levels to just the equity base. So we're going to allow them to trade debt, commodities, specific uh, equity, such as REITs, ETFs, even the option world, we're going to allow them to get into. Of course, with oversight, of course, with parameters, but we're going to allow them to understand that you, you, can, you can use these tools at your disposal to take advantage of the market or to combat the market. You know, that's part of the way the world works. It's not just about trying to pick three of the S&P 500 and let it ride. We can let them actively manage. You know, that, that's the objective here. And then, of course, perhaps the most distinguishing characteristic is we are going to enter private markets. You know, very few, com or very few schools, I'm sorry, allow that to happen. And we are going to do it, um, and we hope to do it well. Uh, and I'll drive home that point with some actual numbers here in a moment. But trust me, this is a relatively unique thing that we are doing with that. Now we did, and I'm going to go quickly through this because I don't want to bore you, but we did in developing the program examine some schools that we, you know, we didn't want to live up to, we didn't want to replicate, but of course we wanted to gain knowledge from. So you can see a list here of the schools we looked at. You know, obviously we started looking locally within our state, but as you can see we aim pretty high with what we want to compare ourselves to as well. Top 20 schools, Ivy League schools, those are the schools that my students are going to compete for jobs with. You know, and so I want to, I want to look at what they're doing. Of those schools, oops, sorry. Yeah, let me just go do this. Of those schools, 38 of them have a managed fund of some type. All right, 38 have a managed fund of some type. But most of those, the majority, and it's, it's a significant majority, only allow for public equity investment, and, and that's it, only equity investment. So that makes us relatively unique there as well. Only three of them allow for private equity investment. Okay, we're looking at a relatively unique sample there, and, we, and, and we're not exactly like those three either, so we're not replicating those three because some of those three don't allow some of the other stuff we, we do, such as all the public trading. So we really do have, I have not found a program that does exactly what we do. Now, I'm not saying that necessarily as, wow, we're, we're better than everyone else. We just want to be more flexible. We want to see what works. We want our students to get an exposure to as much stuff as possible, you know, and that's what we're trying to do with this. Now, I will sign off here in a moment and let the students impress you more than I ever could. But I want to talk about the mention, mission, excuse me, real quick. You can read it here, but I can actually say it a lot more simply than this. Our objective simply is to let students show what they know. Okay? We are not trying to train students to win Jeopardy. You know, factoids are great. You know, being knowledgeable is great. Being able to spew facts out is great. Showing an employer that they can come in the first day that they're on the job and do something, contribute to the firm, is what we're after. Okay, that's what we're trying to do, show what we know. The objectives, if you look at them a little bit closer here, you will see the one that you're probably expecting to see right here at the bottom. We do want to make money. 
<laughs> yes, we do. It's not a secret. All right? That is one of our objectives. We want to show, not just for the sake of making money, but we want to show that we can do this as well as any other student organization. And yeah, maybe as well as a lot of the professionals. We want to show that we can do that, or we certainly want to hope to show we can do that. That is one of our objectives. Much more importantly than that are the other objectives. We want our students to be competitive when they hit the job market. Okay? We believe in our students. I've already said that, and I, it's, it's true, we do. And we don't believe in them just by, you know, because we're supposed to. I, we believe in them because we see them every day. And we believe, them to, believe in them to the point that if they are competitive in a job, they will not only compete for the job, they will take that job. We have to put them in a position to do so, and that's what this program is trying to accomplish. Along those lines, a couple weeks ago, just as our first little piece of evidence of this, we had a visit for the first time in our school's history from several members of Goldman Sachs. It's the first time that they had ever come down, and they took a good hard look at our program, and they came away feeling much better, a higher quality uh, standard of our students, their opinion, than they had when they came here. And that's all you can ask for. The, uh, the Goldman visit was uh, you know, the highlight or one of the highlights of my career. It's the most rewarding day I've had, or one of them, as a professor. There is nothing better than having your students show that they're ready. You know, they're ready to go help the firm. They're ready to go do something. And that's what my students showed them. Okay, and, I, and I, think, I think that'll be a trend as we go forward. Okay, so I've talked enough. I want to turn it over to the students. They are going to take you through just a very abbreviated version of what we do in class every day. Every student has a role. Every student does their role, but they also are equity analysts, and they are going to cover a firm here for you in a very abbreviated fashion. And if you have any questions for me, obviously later, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Eric Bannero, and I'm a portfolio manager of the Student Investment Program. Hi, everyone. My name is Allie Kroll, and I'm the Asian economist within our program. My name is Justin Coppola, and I'm also a portfolio manager as well. In our decision to purchase uh, 26 shares of Anheuser-Busch, it wasn't just made by a group of college students who thought we would put some money into a beer company and see what happens. <laughs> It was a well-calculated investment thesis that used industry research and detailed valuations. One of the most important things you have to consider when investing in any equity is to look at what the specific subsector or industry is. And in doing so, you can see how similar companies have compared to the overall market. Starting with a brief overview of consumer staples, in terms of subsectors, companies within this sector produce essential items such as food, beverages, tobacco, and household products. The sector is also non-cyclical, meaning that it is less sensitive to economic changes. This is beneficial because it has the ability to outperform the market in case of an economic downturn. In analyzing consumer staples before our investment, we looked at the consumer staples sector spider, and this is an ETF, and what it does is it gives you a gauge of the performance as a sector. And what we saw at our time of investment, which was October 15th, is that this spider ETF actually was underperforming the S&P 500, which is our benchmark index, by about 3%. Despite this lower return, we still like consumer staples for two reasons. One, it produces slow and steady growth, and it also has low volatility. As you can see by this chart, this shows a five-year history. We have consumer staples represented by the blue line and our S&P benchmark index represented by the red line. Evidently, you can see the low volatility of this sector. It has a historic beta of 0.6, as well as generally steady growth and a weak correlation with the market, which makes it a safer sector for investment. While we like the overview of the consumer staple industry, we find it's very interesting that Anheuser-Busch InBev is actually gaining exposure to the craft beer industry. This industry has grown in 2010 to 2011 at a rate of 13%, and over the past five years, it's grown at double-digit rates. In 2011 to 2012, it actually increased and grew at 15%. Over the past few years, they've actually gained ex more and more exposure to this industry. They've purchased Shock Top, which is actually a local South Carolina brewery, Goose Island, which was from Fulton Street Brewery, 
and they also have more public exposure to Craft Brew Alliance. They currently have a 32% stake in the company. As you can see here, the U.S. is at a record high for total amount of breweries within the United States. And currently, we have reached 2,538. And in the late 1970s, we reached an all-time low, excluding prohibition, uh, of 89 breweries. So, I mean, you can see this exponential rate as an increase, and many would actually consider this as a potential threat. However, with so many breweries around, this is actually providing them with a huge opportunity to increase the ability to purchase these craft beer companies and take them on a more global scale. Looking at some background information of the company, InBev is the largest global brewing company. It has over 200 beer brands in its portfolio with international focus brands including Stella Artois, Budweiser, and Bex. In addition, they have 150,000 employees in 24 countries nationwide in 19 of which they hold the number one or number two market position. If you look at this graph, you can see both InBev's geographic diversification as well as wide market share. Already in three countries, Argentina, Brazil, and Belgium, they have surpassed the 50% mark. In terms of expansionary efforts, the company has embarked on a global growth plan specifically targeting the broader regions of Asia and South America. Their two key target markets after the US are China and Brazil. On the one hand, China represents the most significant opportunity for growth because they only have 13.4% market share right now, and it is the largest global, excuse me, largest beer market in the world. And in addition, whereas InBev usually has five to 15 breweries in their target market countries, in China, they already have 40, with four just being open this past quarter. In terms of market growth in Brazil, the company has more of an established presence here with about 70% of market share. However, revenues were up 9% at the end of last year, and there are two exciting events, namely the World Cup that will be held in 2014, as well as the Olympic Games in 2016 in Rio that present more opportunities for growth. And after looking at this qualitative analysis, we'd now like to transition into some more quantitative analysis that we use for the valuation of this stock. While it's important to take a quantitative look at the stock, we also like the idea of taking both a fundamental and technical look. Understanding the technical analysis is very important. Each red line is actually representing the trough off of the previous peak and each green line represents the peak of the stock. And this is the chart since June 24th of this year, where it reached a low coming off of its prior peak at 86.64, right there. Understanding this, it's actually very important because you can see visibly that each trough is actually higher than the previous trough, which shows that it's in a bullish state. Understanding this is very important to also see that each peak has surpassed the last peak. So not only are we taking a look fundamentally, but the technical look is also pointing an indicator showing that we're very bullish on the stock. There are many different ways to go about evaluating an equity, and one of the most popular approaches is discounted cash flow analysis. For those of you in the audience who are unfamiliar with it, the actual premise is quite simple. You take a company's future free cash flows and you discount them to the present value using a discount factor. In our case, our discount factor is the weighted average cost of capital, which we found to be 8.4%. Oftentimes, you see that companies don't always perform the way you'd like to. So we have a base case, a downside case, and an upside case to represent different scenarios for how a company might actually perform. As you can see, this gave us results of 91, 92 for the low end of our shares and an ultimate high of 120.6 for what we think could be a potential upside. As I previously mentioned, though, there are many different ways of looking at a stock, and so we use their actual direct competitors to generate different price targets based on the following metrics. The top you can see is an average aggregate, and this line right here represents what the stock was trading at when we started doing our valuations. These red bars right here indicate the specific price point for each of these metrics and the bar itself represents a high to low. 
What you notice is you see our price right here to the left of all of these. This is very bullish, indicating that the stock could be intrinsically undervalued by the market. After performing qualitative and quantitative analysis, and we believe that this company is undervalued, we then developed several main reasons for our buy rationale because we did give it a buy rating. First, we think this is a defensive stock and we wanted for our first investment to have something that might be a little safer in light of, for, of possible economic uncertainty in the future. In addition, InBev has a diversified beer portfolio. Not only do they have many locations worldwide, but they also have a wide range of products. The company is well known for both its strong advertising as well as brand recognition, having global, national, and local beers that are widely recognized throughout the world. And lastly, something to keep in mind is that InBev has a favorable tax rate. Whereas its US competitors are about 40% for a tax rate, InBev as an international corporation is at 15%. <coughs> However, as with any investment, it is important to consider the possible risks. The two main risks that we identified are increased U.S. competition as well as low barriers to entry in the beer industry. However, we believe with InBev's large size as well as these aforementioned strengths that these possible threats are not a concern and that the company will continue to perform very well. To conclude our investment thesis, I just want to go over the quick overview of our actual buying rationale. We actually bought the stock on October 15th, 2013, just a little over two weeks ago. We paid $96.34 and we bought 26 shares. Interestingly enough, over that two week span, we're already realizing a 7.7% .7 return. As of last night's close, it closed at $103.73. However, over the same period of time, the S&P 500 is only up 2.7%. And according to the historic beta, it should have underperformed that. Interestingly enough, again, this shows that we've generated an excess return of the market based off of the historical analysis. And this shows that we have actually earned a 5.3% excess return of the market. I'd like to now turn it over to Mr. Steve Swanson. He's been an active member of our advisory committee of the Student Investment Fund. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Well, I, 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 um, I, before I start my um, comments, I, I think um, anybody that's, that's talked with me or heard me speak um, has heard me say how my firm automated trading desk um, one of our secrets, secrets was our ability to find incredible um, young, talented students and bring them into our firm and teach them how to, how to trade. And then they um, very quickly became the engine that created new ideas and made ATD the success it, it, it is and was. So um, I think you're, you're seeing firsthand that you know the, these students are, are truly outstanding and um, seeing opportunities like this is just, is, it's very exciting. So um, I've spent my entire career focused on trading, market microstructure, and investing. And as, as the, the founder of Automated Trading Desk, I, I also uh, benefited by hiring these, these students from the College of Charleston. And as a firm, we looked to hire the very best and the very brightest that, that we could find and teach them to trade, as I said. In the end, even the brightest minds can crumble when faced with pressure of a bad, a bad investment decision. And while it's still very early for them, I think one of the, the, the more exciting parts of this is that they are now faced with real world decisions. And certainly we, don't, we hope that everything will go well, but invariably some of these decisions won't go well and, and they will have to learn how to, to deal with the stress that comes along with with um, a trade or an investment that is not going well. And that's, that's truly the, the beauty of this program is that these students are getting that real world experience. It's no longer theory. This is something that they have to, to, to watch and, and understand. And again, that's, that is the, the exciting part of what makes this program special. 
Their analysis, their hard work, and their insights are now expressed with real dollars. And this, this program is being recognized. As Dr. Piles mentioned, we recently had Goldman Sachs come in here. Other firms are beginning to see the opportunities here. And, and again, I think, I think more and more firms are going to learn and see that the College of Charleston really is, is doing a lot of special things here and is producing great students. This, this phenomenal opportunity is, is helping to showcase the college and its highly competitive business major. And I have to make sure to say that, that this program exists solely because of the philanthropic um, efforts of two great friends of the college, Stephen Marine Kerrigan. <laughs> Stephen Marine are longtime supporters of the college and, having, and have served on the Parents Advisory Council as their, children's Kayleen, their children Kayleen and Sean both went to the College of Charleston. Additionally, Steve serves on the, the Business School Board of Governors as well as the College of Charleston Foundation Board. Inspired, by the, by, inspired to support Dean Shaw's vision of graduating ready-to-work business students, the Kerrigans proposed the concept of this investment program in 2012. The Kerrigan's vision and generous gift of, of half a million dollars has made this program a reality. The program is a remarkable example of what can be accomplished through leadership giving in support of our comprehensive campaign. So again, please, please, please join me in thanking Steve Marine for their incredible leadership and investment in the College of Charleston. So. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dean Chow. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much, and thank you, everybody. Mark, you should be proud. I think you, uh, yeah, you are. You should be. Uh, this is just a sample, three of 20 students, and so many other finance students that I know will will go on and do great things. President Benson, thank you so much for showing uh, your support of this entire program. Steve and Maureen, this is fantastic. Uh, Steve and I met, I think, when I first became dean here, and uh, I know that Steve had a passion to to help students and help us with our ready-to-work uh, efforts. And here we are, and we're off and running. And it's just great. You know, I'm looking at the, uh, at the crowd right now, and what a great, great group. Obviously, with WebEx, uh, we are bringing in people from as far as California. So this is already reaching across the uh, United States and uh, reaching markets that uh, we hope will continue to grow this investment program. Um, I've, got, I've got the easy job. Uh, we're going to do question and answer now. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to, to walk up to the sides here, to the microphones. If you're at WebEx, if you send us your comments, we'll get to them as soon as possible. So I'm also going to be the, the timekeeper. And because of limited space, uh, we have to be out of here by 9.45 Eastern time. So let's go ahead and get started. If you have questions, please approach the, uh, the microphone. Bill Asbill, yes, sir. Hi. Uh, I, I have a question. Have you all established uh, an overall uh, goal for the portfolio in terms of risk, in terms of uh, earnings and the benchmarks that you're, you're going to be uh, marked against? Right. Um, I think one of the most important things to note is that we're using the S&P as our benchmark. And so in our investment strategies, we're trying to construct a portfolio that, um, in a sense, optimizes what we think is a correct investment strategy from a one to three year timeline that has the potential to outperform what the S&P might be doing. As far as uh, certain risk limits go, um, as Dr. Piles had mentioned, we have a diversity of assets that we can use. And so I think we take on the greatest risk in something like derivatives or options trading, um, but that's going to be seen with great oversight as well. Hi, I have uh, two questions. One, what is your uh, what is your sales strategy when you're going to sell the, the the securities? And two, why did you pick the S and P 500 as a as a benchmark when you you know in this particular investment you're using an international stock? Is it really a good invest? Is it really a good benchmark? 
Um, our sell strategy as of right now, um, prior, prior to um, yesterday's earnings, was $110 uh, was our exit strategy for the current financial state of the company. And we felt that at $110, that would be borderline on the exit side of the overvalued and overbought due to the current financial state and ratios on comparables and everyone else. And that it would be overpriced, which is why we'd want to exit then. Um, we used the S&P 500 as a benchmark just because overall we wanted to be able to perform in our equity portfolio. Our international exposure, I think, is limited to around 13%. Um, and I mean, with their domestic ability with Anheuser-Busch, this is also allowing them to have more public exposure and be able to sort of be correlated within the U.S. markets. That being said, I, I, I mean, I think it's a, a good opportunity for us to maybe take a look at it from that international perspective and compare the equities uh, performance to other international uh, indices. I have a question, um, somebody from WebEx, Jonathan Zucker asked a question. He said, as an employer, how do I gain access to these students or um, uh, actually graduates of the program? So from Jonathan Zucker. Well, Dr. Piles, you want to take that one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, resumes are online. Uh, <laughs> My cell phone number is listed at the top. <laughs> hey, hey, you, you better watch it. I, I can answer you're, that you're if, if uh, Jonathan wants to call me, we'll put him in touch real quick <laughs> with all our students. I find the commodity part of it interesting because the colleges and endowment funds, foundations, didn't use to have a commodity part. It was almost like a dirty word. And it's crept back in. And, and I think uh, I find it interesting. But I'm curious, because the leverage factor in commodities, how you will deal with that. Will you go through funds? Will you pick individual commodities? And how will you handle that, uh, that leverage factor? Because it could multiply an investment. I don't need to tell you. Right. <laughs> no, I, I get what you're saying. We're actually, 20% of our portfolio is in uh, ETFs, and that's how we plan to get some sort of exposure to commodities. Um, I think another way of doing so would be, for instance, if we wanted um, exposure to um, oil and gas, buying an airline company that is very sensitive, that would be another way of doing it. But I think ultimately trying to use an ETF and staying away from anything that's triple levered would be um, sort of how we plan to approach uh, going into commodities. But I don't think we're going to touch anything that's... Um, I guess that risky, as far as the triple leverage. Would yeah. that would that include gold? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, because there are, in the foundation world anyway, mm -hmm. there are uh, certain foundations that believe really 10% should be in gold. I mean, I mean, I'm not saying that everybody's a believer in it, but there are those that are uh, that are pretty good that that are, and that that commodity, that particular commodity from an investment standpoint, is a little different than some of the others, even though you could probably argue that one too. But, but uh, would that include gold? I, I mean, I see a potential investment in gold, but it's more of a psychological investment. You can't burn it. You can't eat it. <laughs> I mean, what they're, the uses for it is going to be that historically it has appreciated over time and it's been used as a currency in the past. But uh, I think it's almost safer to use um, other companies, so like companies that are in steel or in silver, where there's an actual industrial use, and that we don't necessarily have to go with gold in particular, and that we can actually have exposure to other commodities rather than gold itself. Thank you. Everyone of age supporting InBev's products on the weekends. Because <laughs> um, you're a hypocrite if you're not. <laughs> it, interestingly enough, uh, we had a we diversified the portfolio, and uh, we had to have at least twenty five hundred dollars into the investment, and that's exactly what it worked out to be is twenty six shares. 
or it was, it was a little over $2,500. So it fit within our consumer staples um, segment of our breakdown of our portfolio as a percentage. Great, great presentation. Uh, two things. Uh, one is, have you thought about, uh, for, for the equity side, particularly global companies, looking at currency risk? That's question one, and I'll give you question two and then sit down. Uh, question two relates, what is your time frame? Uh, Steve over here worked in a time frame of selling things every day. <laughs> at the end of the day, they didn't own anything. Uh, and I don't think that's your time frame. Are you looking, uh, how long will you sit on something uh, waiting for your expected return? And how, how are you going to, uh, how many changes you want to make continually in the portfolio? So thank you. Uh, understanding each investment, obviously there's risk and there's also a potential downside. But we're not investing in it for the short term. Short term. We're investing in it in about a two to three year range where we think that the business strategy over the next two to five years is going to put them in a prime position to expand globally, expand their market share, and also gain exposure to the craft beer industry. I mean, if you're speaking as a portfolio as a whole, we are trying to keep within a two-year range because that's what we're looking at is the fundamentals of the company. And the fundamentals take time to play out. And their whole strategy, it doesn't happen overnight. And that we're investing in the business strategy rather than just a quick day trade. Oh, and currency, do you want to take currency? Um, yeah, I mean, the currency, right, it, it's an international company, so you have to look at uh, foreign exchange exposure. And um, one of the students in the class, Joshua Smith, is more versed on the subject than I am. But it is a consideration, it is a factor that we have to look at. As far as actually investing directly into currency, um, that's something we have to consider as a class. I think Dr. Piles mentioned it earlier, is we have a lot of autonomy to kind of take the portfolio in a direction that we see fit. If we're bullish on currency, then we have the opportunity to gain exposure there as well. Uh, I have two questions. One of them is structural, and uh, that was, I guess, from what I heard, I guess the whole team rotates off, or do you have like or half juniors and half seniors? Is it going to be continuation from year to year, or is it all a group of seniors and the seniors graduate and pass it on to a new group? That's the first question. And the second question is, typically private equity investments have a high hurdle as far as how much money you have to put into it to be able to get into it. You know, with the dollar amount that you're talking about dealing with and your constraints in the portfolio, how are you going to accomplish investing in that asset class? Um, so for the private equity question, um, we're going to use an alumni, essentially, and try and go through them as part of giving part of our money to them and taking a smaller return. Um, so that's a little more complicated. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Piles can speak. Yeah, let me that. jump in and uh, answer that a little bit. Uh, the, the first question about the, the students turnover. Uh, the, in, in this year, uh, 19 of the 20 are seniors. And that'll be fairly typical because it takes a while for students to get through our program at this liberal arts institution to the point that they could do this. I will obviously oversee the, the transformation or the, you know, the transfer from one student class to the other. But before they leave, both over Christmas and in the spring, they have to give me documented exit strategies that I have to follow. You know, so they'll give me an exit price and I'll put a limit or stop order on it. Every, every asset we got, so I don't make the decisions. I have the ability to do their decisions. But uh, to answer your question, yeah, we'll have a large turnover every year just because of what we do and that'll be part of the challenge that I have. They can answer the, uh, the private a little bit more, uh, but there's several ways we're going to think about it. Uh, we, we don't know yet, frankly. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's three levels of the private equity world. You know, we have the, the angel world, then we have growth stage, and then we, of course, have the LBO world. We're not ready for either one of those top two, quite obviously, where we are by ourselves. We want to learn about all three of them. We may start by dangling our toes in the angel water, you know, or something like that. And then, of course, there are funds out there that trade. They're public funds, but they trade private equities, you know, so that's kind of an end around. So we may do that. Um, Got to take care of our online folks. Um, from Keith Carpenter, he had two questions. First is, um, with regards to the bud investment, you talked about competition and low barriers of entry as a threat. Um, how is bud protecting itself against the growing interest in micro and independent brewers? And do they seem, uh, do they see these as a threat in any way? That's question number one. And the second question is, what are the investment limits per equity investment, is there, is there a limit? I'll take the first question. And honestly, they're protecting themselves by acquiring these companies. As you saw, they've recently or they've bought up Shock Top, and they've also bought up Goose Island 
from Craft Brew Alliance. Um, and with that being said, they're able to take it on a more global scale. And most of these craft beer companies are very uh, geographically centered in one specific region. So it, they don't have the whole exposure to the entire country and have the ability to be in distribution lines. And if they want to get on distribution lines, they actually have to go through a larger brewer like a Molson Coors or Anheuser-Busch. So they're also reaping the benefits of having this um, expanding industry. So do you want to take the second part? Yeah, this, the second part is, is quite simply, um, so we have 58% in equities in total. And so we're trying to keep each investment to a maximum of 5%. So just a tenth of our total equity investment. I have two questions, they're related. Um, the first is, you all are college students, so how are you holding yourselves accountable? Obviously there's work that has to be done outside the classroom in order to be prepared. And the second question is, how are you graded? <laughs> wow. I think what makes this program so unique is that everyone holds themselves and each other accountable because what we really are is a team, you know? This is more than a class. This is really run like a business. So you come in expecting that you're going to do the research, you're going to do the work, but at the same time, we are all learning together. So if there isn't something that you understand, Justin and Eric are great resources, everyone helps each other, and I think that more than anything, it's working together is how we get it done. <laughs> uh, they they have uh, they wear two hats. You know they have a job. You know so portfolio manager, Asian economist. I give them performance evaluations roughly every month. You know just like you would if you're in a job. They get graded on that. They also have to analyze their sector twice a semester. So I grade them on that. And then of course they do their asset pitches twice a semester. They get graded on that. We don't have tests. It's not that kind of class. It's they they have to be self motivated to do this stuff. And uh, and so they get graded on some stuff they turn in, but it's it's much more self motivated. And that's the requirement to get in the class. That's what you have to convince me of. Not your GPA, but that you're willing to work for it. Okay, um, I, you can sit down. I think we're, we're finished with the q and I, I wanted to make a few closing remarks. <laughs> you know, the College of Charleston is extremely unique. I, I think, you know, a lot of times we try to come up with peer institutions, and we can't because the College of Charleston is extremely unique. And we're proud of it. And programs like this, I think, add to that unique feature or the, the unique description that people try to, to give to the uh, College of Charleston. Uh, I want to thank, once again, I, I don't think we can thank them enough, uh, Steve and Maureen Kerrigan, for what they've done for us. They have put us down a path um, as we've just added the major in finance. They've put us in a project projection that is straight up, uh, which, is, uh, which is an absolutely uh, exciting time I'd say for the School of Business as well as the College of Charleston. Um, you know, when, when Steve and I met um, in the past, one of his desires, and I, I hope you don't mind me conveying this, is that others join him in this investment. In other words, invest in the investors. Um, we started off with, with $500,000. Our goal is to get it up to two to three million. And so I'm, I'm looking at uh, all the people in this room and I know online, that uh, could become investors in our students. And we would like you to consider that. Um, if you have an interest, um, I'll be happy to talk to you. I, I'm, I'm the dean here. Uh, and I wouldn't be much of a dean if I didn't, didn't uh, give a quick advertisement about that. But I'm very serious about that. We want to take this program to continue in new heights. I'm sure uh, in the future, the 500,000 will turn into two to three million. Uh, but we want that to happen much quicker than, is, than, than the norm in investing. So, so please consider that. We're going to have a, well, sorry, WebEx people. Um, you won't be able to join us for the reception after this. Uh, but for those of you that are here, we're going to have a reception in the atrium. I want to thank everyone for participating. Um, students, congratulations. Uh, you are doing a phenomenal job, and we're very excited about uh, what you'll be doing. You heard Dr. Pyle say that 19 of the 20 are seniors, so they'll be off and running. I know a number of them already have jobs and something like this. The ready to work is what we're all about in the School of Business. If they're not ready to work, we're not doing our job. What, what we create in, in the School of Business are employable graduates, and that's what we'll continue to do. Um, faculty, 
uh, friends of the college, uh, friends of the School of Business, Board of Governor members, uh, I can't thank you, thank you enough. We cannot do this alone. We have got to continue to have people supporting us. We've got to continue to have companies supporting us, and we've got to have, continue to have uh, government supporting us. So please, everybody, uh, become part of what we're doing in the School of Business. I'm very, very bullish. Thank you so much. We'll continue the party in the, in the atrium.